And there we go. I'd like to welcome all of you to this year's McLean Leadership in Business Award event. I'm Raymond Robertson. I'm the director of the Mossbacker Institute here at the Bush School of Government and Public Service. It's such an honor and a delight for me to be hosting this event and, and to be leading off this event here tonight. Uh, we have a really amazing uh, speaker. We're gonna be listening to uh, Laura Chapman Rubo, who's the director of global public policy at the Walt Disney Company. And I'm sure all of your lives have been touched in one way or another by the Walt Disney Company. She's the director of the Responsible Governance and Supply Chain and Global Public Policy Department of the Walt Disney Company. And in this capacity, her job is to lead the policy analysis, strategic development, and external stakeholder engagement for global human rights and other corporate social responsibility issues across all of Disney's businesses. As the largest licensor of commercial products in the world and consumer products in the world, particular attention is paid to labor standards in global supply chains. And in that regard, Ms. Rubo oversees the development of policy positions and partnerships with intergovernmental organizations, industry associations, and civil society. In addition, she's the chair of the Corporate Social, the Corporate Responsibility and Labor Affairs Committee of the United States Council of International Business, the chair of the steering committee for the International Labor Organization's Global Business Network on Forced Labor, an advisory board member of the Social Accountability International, a stakeholder board member of the Association of Professional Social Compliance Auditors, a senior fellow of the University of Southern California's Brittingham Social Enterprise Lab, a board of overseers member of the University of Connecticut's Human Rights Institute, and she's speaking to us from Connecticut tonight, in fact, and a two-time member of the United States delegation to the ILO's annual International Labor Conference for the committees on the forced labor protocol and the decent work in global supply chains, among other ILO delegations. She's previously worked at, for, at Business for Social Responsibility and GAP Inc. and has a master's degree in international affairs, like many of our students are hoping to get, uh, from the George Washington University and a bachelor's degree in economics and German from the University of Connecticut. She's a dual citizen of the United States and Australia. And we are extremely excited and delighted to welcome and honor uh, Laura Chapman Rubo. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna turn it over to you for your remarks. Well, thank you so much, Professor Robertson. It is such a pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, I thought what I could do is I'll, I'll start with um, some formal prepared remarks for about 25 minutes or so, and then um, hopefully we can take some, some questions and answers. Um, so first of all, thank you. Um, thank you for the, the kind introduction, and it is really wonderful to be with this group this evening. I really wish I could be there in College Station um, to meet you in person, but I am so grateful that technology allows us convening to go for, forward during the COVID-19 pandemic, and I hope you all are safe. Um, to start, I want to express a sincere thank you to Texas A&M University, the Bush School of Government and Public Service, uh, the Mossbacher Institute for Trade, Economics, and Public Policy, the McLean Group, Mr. McLean, um, Professor Robertson, and the many women and men who worked behind the scenes to make this event come to life, from tech support to communications to administrative staff. Thank you. I am honored to be chosen this year for the 2020 McLean Leadership and Business Award. And I am grateful to be a part of the conversation with public policy students, faculty, administrators, business leaders, and friends. My hope today is to share some insight into how one lives a career that marries public service, business, and human rights, and to give you a, a peek into the world of corporate, corporate social responsibility, and specifically human rights and global supply chains. So what is this seemingly odd intersection of disciplines? Why would a company employ someone like me? What are the issues we face? Why should universities and public policy schools in particular support this work? What are some of the things I've learned about this field? When I describe my career to the layperson, I usually get one of two responses. The first one is a confused but polite nod and a gracious segue into discussing the weather. The other response I get is, wow, that is so interesting. I'm really happy to hear that companies have people like you to do this work. If I'm lucky enough to get the latter response, then people usually ask how I got into this field. So 
let me start with that. First, there are people like me working in companies, big and small, throughout our country. There are people who are committed to public service and business. Many of my peers have public policy or international relations degrees. Some have law or business degrees. But more than that, there are a few things we have in common. Number one in prevailing trait among us is a keen interest in the world beyond our borders, a deep curiosity to understand how societies and economies operate and interact with each other. My peers are people who have been to dozens of countries and take pride in the number of passport stamps they have. Like other uh, people in my field, I've always sought to travel, especially international travel. In fact, my travel story starts at birth when I was born in Australia to American parents who were in the midst of a number of years of living abroad. My dad was a geology major who subsequently served in the US Army in Hohenfels, Germany. There he met my mom, an American, for, who was working for the Department of Defense as a teacher on US military bases, first in Northern Germany, then in Japan, and then in Southern Germany. After they met and married in Germany, they were ready for their next adventure. And as one often does, they moved to Australia so my dad could become an exploration geologist in the bush. After a few years of what my mother affectionately called digging for rocks, they returned to the US with two young daughters in tow and a household of foreign objects from lands abroad. My early childhood then consisted of hearing about my parents' stories of living outside the US, being employed abroad, making friends in foreign countries, and raising children on the other side of the planet, at least for our early years. They were happy to be home, but they spoke with great affection of these earlier years. Our household was full of foreign artifacts. It included the simple artwork that they picked up in places like Cambodia and France, pottery from Japan, and a small carpet or two from Turkey. And when my paternal grandfather passed away, they were eager to lay claim to the brass candlesticks he acquired, or brass candlestick holders that he acquired while serving on a World War II Navy ship in the South Pacific. Growing up surrounded by all of this, I needed no further enticement to seek a career that would have me engaging with people all over the world. And at some point, I read one of Mark Twain's famous quotes about travel. In his book, Innocence Abroad, he wrote, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. This statement resonated deeply with me early on, probably in my high school days, and it put into words why I felt travel was not frivolous, but in fact essential. And it set me down the path of pursuing an internationally focused career a second attribute of people with careers like mine is that we often aspire to some form of public service. Like many of you here with me today, there resides within us a desire to serve the common good or to give back or to promote, to promote peace, whatever you call it. For me personally, I was inspired by something President John F. Kennedy said in a commencement speech in 1963. He was speaking of peace global peace. And he said, what kind of peace do I mean? What kind of peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and to build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not, pure, not merely peace in our time, but peace for all time. So again, this, this really resonated with me and it had me asking, how can I promote peace? 
it then propelled me onward to graduate school to earn a master's degree in international affairs. I wanted to be part of the movement of fostering understanding among nations. And of course, your namesake, President George H.W. Bush, believed this too and expressed a similar sentiment. He said, international exchanges are not a great tide to sweep away all differences, but they will slowly wear away at the obstacles to peace as surely as water wears away a hard stone. So after graduate school, I wasn't sure exactly what kind of institution I wanted to work in. I considered federal government and the United Nations because those were highly desirable and impactful choices for an international affairs graduate. But I felt a personal calling towards the business world. I had a bachelor's degree in economics and had dabbled in international business and trade courses in both undergraduate and graduate school. And my father was in the business world, having worked ultimately for international mining and pharmaceutical companies. I also knew that I tended towards practical solutions, that I was more action oriented and believed that business might be a better fit for me personally and, and maybe a path to quicker impact. But at the time, I, I didn't know what that could look like exactly. And there were certainly no classes one could take in the field of what has now become known as Corporate Social Responsibility, or CSR. The discipline hadn't really been invented yet, at least not in any formal sense. Public policy was one area of study, business was another, and human rights was altogether another field. That's why I'm thrilled to be with you today, virtually at the Bush School, to celebrate your commitment to bringing this intersection of fields to life and to educate the next generation of responsible business leaders and the next cohort of public service professionals working in or with business. So after graduate school, I landed my first job at a popular apparel retailer in San Francisco in 1994, at a time when there was emerging interest in understanding how manufacturing was occurring all over the world. And there was an interest in not simply understanding it, but there was also emerging commitment to help improve those conditions if they were deficient. So at the company I was with, we created a code of conduct for suppliers that banned child labor and forced labor, among other things. And we sent teams into factories all over the world to monitor working conditions. One of my very first job responsibilities was to read the written reports coming back from our field teams to see if they had observed underage workers or underpayment of the legal minimum wage rate. This was in the mid 1990s. It was 25 years ago. And that was the start of what became known as corporate social responsibility. Um, lastly, one of the attributes that I just want to highlight about people in my field is that we have a certain comfort with complexity and a comfort with contradictions and a comfort with gray space. And maybe it's not comfort exactly, but at least an acceptance that things are not black and white. There is not one right answer or one right way to achieving impact. One of the few books written about the people in this field of work is called The Evolution of a Corporate Idealist by Christine Bader. She describes her own experience, satisfaction, and then ultimately some disillusionment of working in large companies to quote unquote do good. She interviewed others in this field and summed it up as follows. We believe that business can be a force for good even as we struggle with our contradictions. We don't join anti-globalization protests, but agree with some of their calls for reform. We are disgusted by excessive CEO compensation, but aspire to do better for ourselves and our families. We push our companies to offer sustainable products, but balk at organic prices when doing our own shopping. We defend our companies to investors and campaigners, but insist to our colleagues that we're not doing enough. And it's this last piece that rings especially true, I think, for many of us working inside of or on behalf of companies. We sometimes struggle between truly believing that 
business as a force for good and seeing firsthand the many contributions that our companies make to society, some seen and more unseen. But we want business to be better, to do better. We've chosen specifically to work with that complexity inside business to help propel action. <clears throat> so let me move on now to a little bit of how this field works in practice. And again, I'm really focusing on supply chains and consumer supply chains. First, uh, trade has existed since the beginning of humankind. And that's essentially what a supply chain is. I won't give you a fancy definition from an economics textbook, but supply chains are just ways for people, entrepreneurs, and companies to work together to get the things they need. And trade across borders, however those borders have been drawn or defined, has existed for millennia, from the Phoenicians in the Mediterranean Sea to the ancient Silk Road across Asia to the native peoples of the Americas. Of course, technology, trains, airplanes, computers, the internet, and so much more has further enabled more widespread trade and connected our world more deeply. And trade has brought economic opportunity, prosperity, inclusion, and access to peoples and communities around the world. I truly believe that. Supply chains also aren't just about trade or transporting items from one country to another in a simple binary way. All of us now are watching this on a laptop, a tablet, or a phone. So let's just talk for a minute, a minute about where that device came from. It is the result of a vast interconnected network of networks that includes the movement of all the parts that make up a product. For example, your laptop may start with precious metals and minerals that are extracted from the earth in one part of Africa, which then gets shipped to a smelter in another country, then transported by sea to Asia to create a processor which then gets moved to another factory where a screen and a microphone and a speaker are all added. And all those parts may have originated in different countries everywhere. Then that final assembled laptop is going to travel across lands and oceans to a store where someone is employed to sell it to you, either in person or online. So a simple everyday product you buy and use may be the result of dozens of enterprises or companies employing thousands of people in many countries. And while again, I truly believe that such trade has created far more benefit than harm, it is not without some unintended consequences. And so this is why corporate social responsibility or CSR professionals exist to seek to understand those potential or actual negative impacts, to work inside their companies or with companies to prevent and address them, to work with policymakers, nonprofit groups, civil society, intergovernmental institutions, and researchers to advance better policies, practices, and accountabilities. But how does a business person's role relate to a policymaker's role? What should a company do and what should a government do? Governments, after all, exist to represent and protect their people. They pass laws, including labor laws, and then enforce those laws to protect their working citizens and all citizens. In 2011, the United Nations essentially this answered this question of what is the role of government versus business? it adopted a set of principles to clarify and catalyze efforts to address business-related impacts on human rights and to articulate roles and responsibilities. Known as the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, it sets out what is known as the three-pillared protect, respect, remedy framework. To be clear, these principles weren't the start of corporate social responsibility. As you may recall, back in the early to mid-1990s, consumer products brands and other companies had started establishing principles and expectations for their business partners about human rights, especially in supply chains. And some of these principles and programs were done in partnership with governments and civil society. 
But the UN guiding principles went a long way towards clarifying roles and responsibilities and inspiring more business enterprises to join the call. So to explain them better, uh, I'd like to pause and show you a roughly a three minute video. This video will explain these UN guiding principles a bit better. Businesses impact human rights wherever and however they operate. These impacts can be positive or they can be negative. These days, companies are global and that means their impacts are too. Companies operate in poor countries and post-conflict countries, in countries where the local government is unable or unwilling to enforce its own laws. With all this complexity, it's not always clear who's responsible for preventing companies from violating human rights. Is it the company's fault for paying less than a living wage? Or is it the government's fault for setting the minimum wage below the poverty line? Victims of corporate human rights abuses find themselves trapped between two actors who have no interest in making things right. In 2011, the United Nations issued a set of principles that define the responsibilities of governments and businesses for solving this dilemma. So what do these principles say? There's three pillars. The first says that governments have to make sure that businesses don't violate anyone's human rights. That means passing laws that prevent human rights violations, but also making sure these laws are implemented. Some of the world's largest multinational corporations are owned and operated by states. The guiding principles say that governments have to prevent human rights violations by businesses, even if the state itself is acting like one. The second pillar says that businesses have to refrain from violating human rights wherever and however they do business. That means it's not enough for companies to simply follow the law where they operate or to audit a few of their suppliers. Even in countries where the government doesn't take up its own duty, companies have to know their human rights impacts and take concrete steps to improve them. The guiding principles don't offer any loopholes. Companies are responsible for all human rights. Doing things like building a school or digging a well doesn't get them out of their basic responsibility not to make their workers and communities worse off. Companies have to perform human rights due diligence. That means talking to the people whose lives they might be affecting. Like the government responsibility, respecting human rights isn't a switch that companies can turn on and off. It's a continuous process. The third pillar of the guiding principles is about what happens when something goes wrong. If a company abuses human rights, governments have to make sure that the court system or some other legitimate process allows the victims to file a complaint and that that complaint is investigated and settled. Companies have this obligation too. Part of human rights due diligence is allowing people affected by the company to file grievances and participating in processes to make them right. Whatever route they choose, remedy mechanisms should fit with the effectiveness criteria defined by the guiding principles. If the complaint system is slow or it costs too much money or it's far away, it doesn't count. So that's what the guiding principles on business and human rights say. So why are they important? First, the principles were unanimously approved by the UN Human Rights Council. Since then, they've been endorsed by governments and business actors all over the world. Before, we argued over who was responsible for preventing human rights abuses by companies. Thanks to the UN guiding principles, we know who's responsible. That means that instead of arguing over the rules, we can get to work implementing them. Great, thank you. Uh, I hope that video was helpful. I hope it wasn't too wonky. Um, I actually encourage you to read the principles themselves. It's, it's actually a, a very easy read. Um, so for me, the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights uh, did help to clarify what to do and who should do it. It's the how that is a bit more complicated. We understand human rights due diligence to be the activity in business that we need to undertake. We understand that in the case of supply chain relationships where we don't own and operate those independent businesses, that we should seek to use our leverage or our influence with those business partners to help address adverse 
human rights impacts and affect positive change. Of course, it's not so straightforward. Let me be clear. Most companies don't need to be convinced to do the right thing. They're made up of people like you and me. Most companies don't need to be persuaded to take action when they understand an adverse human rights impact to be occurring somewhere in a connected supply chain. But the question is often how. How can a multinational company know everything that is happening everywhere all the time that may be connected somehow to their products or services? And how exactly can we use our leverage or our influence to help address an, in an issue once we know it is occurring? There is not one definitive answer to this, but what I can say is that no two companies are alike. And the role of the embedded CSR professional and their colleagues throughout the company is in some ways an exercise in understanding that unique company's assets. So if you're working inside of a company and you're a CSR professional or contributing to that work, it's vital to understand your company's business model, values, history, priorities. Not because human rights impact should be treated differently depending upon the company you work for, but because one company can use its assets and its unique leverage to affect positive change in very different ways than another company might. And leverage or influence can exist or not exist in surprising ways. It can be far greater or lesser than the general public might assume. We talked about laptops before. Now let's talk about something else that's common in our lives, let's say coffee. Uh, perhaps many of you woke up this morning and you had a, a cup or two of coffee. Then while sipping that coffee, you perhaps read an article or you could have read an article about child labor being connected to the harvesting of coffee beans for your favorite brand of coffee. One might assume then that this coffee brand just needs to tell their suppliers to stop the child labor and magically it stops. But what we may not know is that perhaps that coffee brand only buys 0.001% of the world's coffee beans. Maybe that coffee brand isn't all that important to that implicated supplier. Maybe that supplier doesn't really don't want, want to meet that coffee brand's high standards and has other buyers who expect less. Now, the coffee brand isn't just going to throw up their hands and say, oh, it's just too hard or it's not our problem. The coffee brand is likely to conduct an on-site investigation of the child labor, talk to their supplier about what happened, and set expectations for improvement. They may talk to other coffee brands and buyers to see if they can establish or accelerate common expectations for that supplier or that coffee exporting country. They may remind the government of their duty to enforce child labor laws. They could offer training or incentives or other forms of support to help their supplier avoid child labor in the future. And all of this kind of effort happens every day behind the scenes by all kinds of companies. Now, an important element of success, however, is also what the local government does or doesn't do. So, I mean, the local government where that coffee farm or that metal smelter or the wire that went into the laptop, where those enterprises and governments are located. The question might be for those local governments, do they have the right child labor laws in place? Do they employ labor inspectors? Have they trained labor inspectors to visit coffee farms or smelters to conduct inspections? If child labor is the result of young people having no or limited access to educational opportunities, can the government build or better support schools? In these countries, are working people free to express their views about workplace conditions? Do bribery and corruption impede efforts to find out what's going on and then to drive improvement? These are important questions and critical in understanding and improving business-related human rights impacts. One of the important ways in which both business and government discuss these questions together 
is through international forums. In particular, the, labor, the International Labor Organization, the arm of the United Nations focused on international labor standards, convenes government, employers, and workers to negotiate international labor standards and then to advance those internationally endorsed standards for what they call decent work. Business has a formal seat at the table in this institution to bring their experience to bear as employers specifically, but also generally as businesses that are engaged in trade that create economic opportunity and jobs. Another important international convening is the annual United Nations Forum on Business and Human Rights. Coming up to its ninth year, this forum invites all sectors of society from all parts of the world to come together for three days in Geneva, Switzerland to learn about business related human rights impacts and to contribute to solutions. For business people and policymakers, these international conversations are vitally important. These forums, among other things, are places to discuss dilemmas and quandaries, where taking action to address one human rights issue may create a set of unintended consequences. This is something that we talk about a lot in the corporate responsibility world, unintended consequences. Business is generally good at building process of establishing a set of policies or principles and then applying them in a real world setting. So we plan out scenarios and we ask, what happens next? If we apply this policy, then how does it actually get implemented? And what happens at step two and at step 10? For example, if a multinational company leaves a country because of human rights concerns, does that departure eventually contribute to job loss and economic hardship? If a quote unquote responsible buyer or brand leaves a country, does that create a vacuum for less scrupulous actors to enter? Do conditions worsen? How much of that is one big company's responsibility? How much is the local government? Does the threat of leaving inspire real and sustainable change by that local government or those local suppliers? Is it the catalyst that's needed? What will truly motivate a government to take action to protect their people? And is it the carrot or the stick? Sometimes it's hard to know. And just because one action by business works in one instance or one country, it may not work the next time. So companies do seek actually to pool their influence and leverage. There are numerous peer-to-peer -peer and multi-company collaborations. Sometimes it's formal and oftentimes it's informal. Picking up the phone and calling peers at other companies, sharing challenges we face, brainstorming about what might work, figuring out if or how we might join forces to affect positive change. And this business person to business person engagement occurs especially internally, inside companies. Every day it's dialogue and collaboration with internal colleagues in all kinds of departments, sourcing and procurement, government relations, communications, legal, finance, IT. This is the part that is truly unseen the countless hours of reading and learning and listening to the expectations of society, customers, guests, investors, policymakers, and then evaluating what it could mean for our business, discussing the issue with our internal colleagues and facilitating conversations about what to do, and as I said before, how to do it. So let me wrap up by saying that it's an endlessly challenging and fascinating and meaningful career. I have seen a lot of change and am heartened to know how much more awareness there is about business related impacts on human rights. I hear my peers in my company and other companies talk about breakthroughs they've had. We've all collectively deepened partnerships with governments intergovernmental organizations and civil society groups that are having real impact on the ground in improving working conditions. 
I can truly say that I love the work that I do and I encourage those of you listening to join us on this path. For the students, especially in this audience, if your goal is a career in the business world, we welcome you and invite you to join us inside biz business to help us solve more human rights dilemmas. We don't even need you to become a quote unquote CSR professional. In fact, it would probably be even better to have you in positions in marketing, investor relations, procurement, and IT. Let's mainstream ethical supply chains. If you're a student working in government, with us in designing policy solutions that work. It's safe spaces for us to share with you our opportunities and challenges. Let's talk together about the unintended consequences of potential policy action, but more importantly, what policies do seem to work and have a higher likelihood of achieving real impact. If you aim to work in civil society, know that we share your objective of promoting a more sustainable world. And if you seek a career in academia, help us and inspire and educate the next set of business leaders and policymakers. Finally, I want to close by reiterating something else that President Bush once said, public service is a noble calling and we need men and women of character to believe that they can make a difference in their communities in their states and in their country. So thank you for your time today and best of luck to you all. And I'll turn that back over to Professor Robertson. Wonderful, well thank you so much, Laura, for those wonderful remarks. And they're, they're really, really inspiring and you really hit on all the topics I think that, that people in our community are really concerned about. Uh, we do we have a little time for a, a conversation if you don't mind i mean one of the things that i've been i've been following your career you know for a long time i've been a fan and i've been impressed with all the different uh, areas that you've been involved in um a couple of questions i was kind of wondering if you might share with us is um uh, what are some of the things you've been the most proud of you know in your career like what have been you've been engaged in so many different things with the federal government internationally with the council of international business of obviously at disney so can you talk about some of those like examples or stories that you have that you really make you the most proud of your career? Yeah, thank you. Um, it first of all always feels like I've I haven't done enough and I have so much more to do. So um, it's it's rare to sit and reflect upon you know what I'm proud of. But um, I guess I would say two things. Uh, one is being a part of formal. U.S. delegations to international negotiations representing business and bringing practical business experience to bear on the conversations. And sometimes it's not even in the formal negotiation room where, you know, I've experienced breakthroughs with people. Sometimes it's um, it's actually outside of the negotiation room and it's going to get a cup of coffee where you run into a government official or someone from a civil society group and you start a conversation that, that builds awareness, right? So, so that has been really impactful for me is to participate in these international negotiations and to, and to be open to meeting people from all over the world and, and who don't come from business. The second thing that I'm proud of is that my company started something called the Supply Chain Investment Program, where we have set aside um, now what is almost collectively or cumulatively about $20 million to contribute to innovation in understanding and addressing human rights issues and global supply chains. And we have funded organizations from, from UNICEF to the International Labor Organization to um, technology companies to nonprofit groups. And the idea behind it is to, um, to partner with others outside of our company to, to create new approaches and tools and solutions. And I really believe through some of that partnership that people on the ground all over the world have, have improved their working lives. Um, there's more to do, of course, but you know, I've been really proud to be involved in that particular initiative. I know that a lot of our students um, are to going into federal government and they have a lot of interaction with the federal government. Can you talk a little bit about how you have engaged with the federal government and what kind of opportunities and what are the key needs 
that you see of, of people who want to go into the federal government? What do they really need to understand and what would be helpful for making working conditions and, and lives better around the world? Yeah, you know, I probably have been engaging with with civil servants in the federal government since, um, you know, probably the early 2000s and have been fortunate to meet people in the Department of State and the Department of Labor. And one of the things that I have always been truly impressed with is their commitment to public service. Um, and in particular, again, I'm talking about the civil servants, the people who are there throughout different administrations who are consistent and committed to public service and to um, representing the, the best of, of America and to looking for solutions. So uh, I certainly have worked with people in the Department of Labor and specifically the International Labor Affairs Bureau. Um, I have worked with people in the Department of State and their Bureau, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor and many other federal government agencies. But um, one of the things that, that has always impressed me is, is their true commitment um, to doing good. Um, I think for, for students, especially in this call, who want to join the federal government, I, I applaud you and I encourage you. And one of the things I would um, ask, you, ask you to continue is the openness and the dialogue with business. Um, and especially, you know, I've often worked for big business. Um, I've had the really good fortune of having lots of off the record and informal conversations with, with people on different federal government agencies who, who are genuinely interested in learning and understanding, and they don't, don't necessarily jump to the conclusion of what's, what some kind of policy solutions should look like. So my, my advice and my ask of you would to be um, to open to engagement with business and openness to, to learning. Yeah, that's one of the things we really try to emphasize with students as well. So I think students coming from here would have a great future in that, in that direction. Um, one of the things I'm just wondering, you've had this amazing career and it's really fun to see all of the different places you've gone and things you've done. Have you noticed any trends or changes? Like how is it different? How is the environment different now than when it was when you started? Like what are the, how have priorities changed or you know, awareness changed? Or uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned and what you see kind of looking at the trends? Yeah, so, you know, I've been at it, I guess, for 25 years, um, something like that. And so there have been changes uh, and developments over time. Um, the first thing, of course, is that there is so much more awareness, thanks again to technology, about human rights and what people are experiencing all over the world. And, and it's, it's much easier, I think, for, for people to get, you know, get their stories told. And so that, that is a lot a lot easier and a lot more welcome. Um, I think the probably the biggest thing is that there is now an emergence of regulation on global supply chains in particular. Um, when I started in the early to mid 1990s, a lot of the companies who were starting this work were doing it for a couple of reasons. One, it was consistent with their company's ethical values or it was driven by um, wanting to kind of manage the reputation of their brand. Um, and so it was, it was partly driven by kind of risk management and ethical values and reputation enhancement. That's really kind of why companies started to approach this work in the, in the 90s. But nowadays, um, particularly starting around 2011, 2012, um, not just with the UN guiding principles that I mentioned, which is still a voluntary set of internationally accepted principles, but there now have been governments who are passing laws um, requiring companies to take certain action with their supply chains or at a minimum disclose what they're doing to understand and address human rights impacts related to their products and services. And so it's this growth of regulation, I think that is, has been the, the fundamental difference in the last two years. And, you know, I talked before about unintended consequences. There are pros and cons to that, right? So it's, you know, on, on the surface, of course, all this legislation is well-intentioned and I think we, we need much more focus on protecting human rights. But as I said, when you unpack some of these regulations, sometimes they have unintended consequences and there's 
probably not enough time to talk in the, the last you know bit of our time here about that but um, that's why I say kind of policymakers and people in business being open to engaging with with business about about the right kinds of policies I think is a really critically important need going forward one of the things we've started here at the Mossbacker Institute is a program in global value chains and global value and global value chains. And so that's going to include this educational component. It's going to, you know, really include a reg, uh, understanding of these regulations and to help train people to go into these types of jobs, uh, especially in CSR. I mean, it'd be really great, I think, for people to follow in your footsteps. Um, we have a couple of uh, questions from the audience that people sent in earlier. We could kind of move into those if you want. But before, you know, I jump into those, just, is there anything that you'd like to leave us with? I mean, just advice, you know, for uh, students going forward or support for the program? What would you like to see out of the Global Value Chains program we're starting? Something like that. Well, thank you, first of all, for even having it in the first place. I think there are not a lot of universities who have quite this uh, commitment and the kind of the understanding of the contribution of global value chains. So, I mean, kudos to you, first of all. We also need um, a lot more research, right, um, focused on kind of what are the, you know, how do global value chains work? Um, I would say that... Um, to the extent that you're doing research and training, the research, of course, should be, in my view, as a business person, should be action oriented, right? And and not sort of, I'm, I used the word before, wonky, not overly wonky, right? So, you know, um, I always look to to kind of concise, action oriented briefs on supply chains or any activity, not you know, 100 page policy briefs. So that is um, less useful and will be <laughs> less read. Um, so kudos to you on that. Um, I think I want to reinforce maybe just one point about um, we don't necessarily need people to be quote unquote CSR professionals working in CSR or sustainability departments per se. I think part of the, the educational opportunity is um, for people to, to take this learning and this understanding and to bring it into finance departments and investor relations and procurement and and information technology you know right help help build systems that allow companies to have access to information about how deep and broad their their value chains are and what are the social and environmental and you know conditions that exist in different layers of, of these value chains? So, so we really need um, people all throughout business um, to be educated in this space. Mm -hmm. So we uh, have been taking questions for several days leading up to this event. So we have this very long list. So if I, I'm going to get to as many as I can, but if we don't get to all of them, I apologize to anyone who's sending in questions because um, they're all great, and I'm glad we have so much interest. Uh, the first one that we really got in was, you know, how do you ensure this compliance in the foreign supply chains that may or may not have the technology, as you just mentioned, how important that is, to document uh, their activities? That seems like really a big challenge. How do you deal with that? Yeah, so um, so I will try to answer all these questions briefly, so at least I, I get through some of them. Um, so this one, obviously, is a great, great question, and I, I can, I'll answer it in two different ways. So, so first of all, um, there are, you know, internationally accepted principles related to labor rights in particular. So, you know, long ago, the International Labor Organization, with all of its member governments, which now is 187 member nations, agreed that there are fundamental principles and rights at work. Um, and I'm just going to shorthand them, but basically it's you know, child labor, forced labor, discrimination, and freedom of association, or interference with the legal, for, legal right to associate. Um, those, those sort of general principles are sort of widely understood to be kind of the basics. That along with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights coming out of the UN in 1948 are, are really sort of the underpinnings of what we, we understand to be um, the right kinds of standards. Now, the question, as I said before, is, is the how. How do you know where there are human rights impacts? And technology plays a huge part in that and is, is making information more accessible. Um, on the one hand, you see now farmers in rural places 
all over the world who have smartphones and who are able to buy and sell and, 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 and engage in, in enterprise and in business and in trade because they have smartphones. And so, so there's access to information that is extraordinary now. On the other hand, um, looking at big businesses, a company like mine uh, or others, we could have 100,000 suppliers in the first tier of our supply chain. And those 100,000 suppliers could then be working with another 100,000 second tier suppliers. And then they could be working with third, fourth, fifth, sixth tier suppliers. And so there is still a huge technology gap in helping all of the entities in these value chains get access to information about who's in the value chain and what are the conditions in all these value chains. So if someone can, can crack that nut, we would really appreciate it because right now to date, it's really been a lot of pilot projects and um, kind of the answer isn't, isn't quite right at our fingertips yet. So you're saying there's lots of opportunities for student research. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a, I hope our students are hearing that. They're going to pick up on that. That'd be great. I'd love to work with them. Uh, we got a student uh, in industrial distribution who's graduating in December who's really interested in supply chain management. And he was wondering, you know, what sort of challenges do you encounter in terms of cultural differences when you're finding solutions or funding? You mentioned you were supporting lots of different of these pilot programs um, to non-compliance of international labor standards. Right. So, again, you know, I there are internationally accepted principles that fundamentally everyone believes are the right ones. And, and again, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, adopted in 1948 is a really good basis to look at. And then again, the International Labor Organiza Organization in 1998 adopted the Declaration on the Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work, which again, just a shorthand, really focuses on child labor, forced labor, discrimination, and interference with the legal right to associate. So, you know, many governments, many, many countries and many governments have, um, you know, adopted that, at least that those general frameworks, and then have created national labor law that exists on the books. And so oftentimes when, when we're facing challenges, we turn to that country and we ask them to take a look at their own laws um, that they have kind of ratified, that they've adopted, um, and that are public law. And almost every country in the world is going to prohibit child labor and forced labor and, and a whole range of other things. And so it, it, it is very, very helpful when you're talking to a supply chain partner about what their own country and what their own society already prohibits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of variation across countries, both in terms of laws and norms, right, in particular. Um, so we have another question, just how, how, where would you recommend someone begin their career in the hope to work with organizations that want to promote you know, human rights? I mean, so what, what are some of the things, you went into international uh, relations, of course, you got your major, I mean, I think that's a good idea. Or do you have some other pieces of advice, like internships or something, like where should students go when they're trying to get started? There are so many career paths, which is the exciting thing about this space. So uh, clearly I took the path through business. Um, people can, can go into the federal government, which we talked a little bit about, or international institutions, um, nonprofit groups or NGOs. There are um, socially responsible investors, um, and uh, you know, call them SRIs, uh, that are out there in the space that are evaluating the social and environmental performance of companies. Um, clearly, I would say that internships are incredibly helpful. Um, you know, take the opportunity uh, if you if you can. Obviously, it's a little bit difficult in the COVID nineteen days, but to the extent that you can find internships there um, in Texas, but take opportunities during summer breaks, maybe to go to Washington D.C. or New York City, uh, go to other countries even, go to London, go to Paris, Hong Kong, Buenos Aires, um, and see if you can actually get your your feet wet with real real work experience, that is critically important. Um, the other thing I will say is I, I do think a master's degree is pretty important. Um, almost everyone I work 
I work with has some form of a master's degree. It doesn't specifically have to be a public policy or international relations degree, but I tend to come across a lot of people um, who have either of those. That's great. I wish we could have this conversation much longer, especially over dinner. We're really hoping to have you for a dinner afterwards, and I'm sorry, we'll have to try and invite you back at some point. Uh, but what I really do want to do at this point is uh, thank everyone for your time, but also I wanted to introduce the gentleman who really made this program entirely possible. Drayton McLean is the chairman of the McLean Group, a diversified collection of businesses, and he's a noted entrepreneur a business leader and a wonderful philanthropist, a great supporter of the school, who's been with the school apparently since the very beginning of the Bush School. We really appreciate all the support he's, he's given us. Um, he's devoted great philanthropic, philanthropic effort to institutions of higher education throughout Texas, including serving as a member of the Bush School Advisory Board in particular. He said President Bush asked him to be on at the beginning of the school. Uh, he held a very special place in the hearts of President and Mrs. Bush, and he holds a very, very special place in our hearts as well. So it is with tremendous honor and humility that I'd like to now turn it over to Drayton McLean. Well, thank you, Dr. Robinson. And uh, your talk, Laura, was truly, truly outstanding. Uh, when any of us think of the word Disney, we get excited, entertainment, and joy. Now we're going to add a new dimension, CSR, corporate responsibility. So you certainly have enlightened us. And I think it's interesting, we talk today so often <clears throat> about new technology, but this is a new career. I think you really emphasize this, that you were in the infancy in the 90s, and this is a new career of social responsibility in corporations that are uh, geared to provide services and programs and products, but to be profitable and now to have an additional responsibility <clears throat> to, to serve not only here in the United States, but where they do business all around the world. So you certainly have, have emphasized that and we thank you for bringing that to our attention. Uh, this is a historic event, Dr. Robinson. We're doing this virtually, not done this before. We all of the previous over 20 of them that, that we have done there in the Bush School in the auditorium and, and I commend you how well this has come off. So Laura, we, we certainly are very excited about you uh, accepting this award from the, the Bush School and the Mossberger Institute and the McLean uh, Lecture on Corporate Leadership and Responsibility. And, the, and this program is directed to try to make the awareness of the public as, as President Bush did, and I heard him talk about this so many different times, of our social responsibility to whatever our career is, is to make a contribution to our fellow man and to do things in a very strong way. And you have shared your values with us, and this is so important. And we're certainly going to take this and to move forward. And you are a trailblazer in this CSR responsibility. So we certainly thank you. I wish I could hand the, the award to you personally, but we'll have to do this as you're in Connecticut and we're in Texas. And it shows the world is changing and we're coming closer together with how we can do things. So thank you for inspiring us and being a, a trailblazer in this corporate social responsibility. And to Dr. Robinson, thank you for continuing to lead this program. This has been a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Mr. McLean, for all of your support and your wonderful words and for being here with us tonight. I also wanted to thank, uh, obviously, Cindy uh, Gauze and Jennifer Moore and Vivian Brunsoller and our team at the Mossback Institute for doing such a great job making this happen. We couldn't have done it without them. And then finally, of course, I'd like to thank Laura. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend this night with us. As uh, Mr. McLean pointed out, we usually like to do these in person. And I hope you will keep uh, an open mind about coming back and visiting us in person so we can take you out for a real dinner after the coronavirus is lifted. And until then, I'd like to thank all the participants for joining uh, us tonight. And we hope you stay safe and stay healthy. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great night.